standing there, you bravely let me in. I could wait a million years or more until you came knocking at my door. It's hard to be. I found a star in you, always guiding me to where my words are true. I've waited a million years before, and I do it all again just to make sure. Yeah, it's hard to be. It's hard to be this real. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Museum Diaries. Welcome back. I have with me Veronica the Duchess and she is a brilliant artist. This woman has been painting for 50 years at least. She's yeah. got tons of artwork. She's published. She's written um, material. Uh, Books and... And she's got another manuscript Studies. that she hasn't released. Another book that she wrote called A Sister Me. When we've done our podcasts, she's introduced Sister Me via the podcast, Jack's Corner. And today she's going to talk to us a little bit about um, some of her excerpts from Sister Me. And she's going to share that. And she hasn't made this public to, to anywhere. You're right. You're right. Anywhere. And we want to say Happy New Year 2022. Happy New Year. Peace and I love you, world. Um... Honestly, I do, and all living creatures, um, may we all be recycled friendly, you know, <laughs> um, do the best we can, right? All right, so I thought I would start off, thank you, Jacqueline, for graciously yes. allowing me to be on your You're show welcome. again. I appreciate it very much. But this is Museum Diaries. We're not, this isn't our podcast. This is our vlog. Okay. And you're here to talk about Sister Me, and it's just got so many interesting stories. It could be made into a movie. Yeah, and I would love could. to see you publish this material. Well, let's do it. Because it's great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we're going to start with um, This is Sister Me. So I, I want to mention real quick, at Museum Diaries as artists, we tap into our genius. This is part of Veronica's genius mind right here. Well, thank you. And we share that with you. So today she's going to share this with you. And sometimes we'll be sharing our paintings with you. I have an idea for a painting that I've been thinking about lately. I was inspired when we went to Mazatlan. This last trip that we took on Norwegian Bliss. And um, yeah, but anyhow, um, Veronica is going to share Sister Me with us. All right. Well, you know, I kind of we're doing this ad hoc and like um i've read some of the script to you guys already once before or maybe twice yeah. okay so um you know i've been going through the pages and trying to you know get these separated so on page 357 of sister me i have a quote from the notorious socialite strangler kenneth bianchi and this is his quote the truth sir is I have absolutely no recollection of faking being hypnotized. I probably faked being a multiple personality. But, sir, when I told the psychiatrist about committing those murders with Angelo, I'm not sure if I was telling the truth or not. I was probably lying when I 
confessed. I was probably not even there during the crimes, or maybe I was, but not in Bellingham. Your Honor, it is the belief or the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office that the person, Kenneth Bianchi, whose continued credibility is essential for the successful prosecution of the murder charges against Mr. Angelo Bono in the Hillside Stranglings, has lost such credibility with our office. The murder charges now pending against Mr. Bono cannot be predicated on the evidence, and the case should be dismissed. Mm. That was the defense attorney. Okay, so for Bono. Mm. So, Sister Me, this is page 358. My first sexual assault was at five. I was 12 when I was raped. My entire life goals were destroyed in the event's aftermath. I n was never to recover from that victimization. And you know, it's interesting because like, I have to say this. Um, I've noticed in a couple of my manuscripts, I put in that my first rape, I was 12, mm -hmm. because I was so ashamed. If people knew that I was only 10, it just made me feel really diminished as a woman. So you added to your series. I, I, I added to, and in some of my scripts, yeah, I'll put that I was 13. Right. Um, but the truth is I was 10. You were 10. Yeah. I mean, police records would show that, that I was missing. And... Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I was 10 when I was raped. My entire life goals were destroyed in the event's aftermath. I was never to recover from that victimization, and even today as I sit writing this, I know I am still emotionally held by that violation. I can't explain how such a thing can destroy the very fiber of a young person's world, how it can destroy a young life, its course and future, how it haunts and uproots the basic stability and normal spontaneous sexuality as adulthood emerges. My early upbringing in the religious Mexican culture markedly pointed out that virginity was not only expected, but without it, I, the young girl Veronica, was destroyed and worthless. That Catholic upbringing, yes, I tell you. If you weren't you know, a virgin, that's right. And you know, we, most of the girls got raped and you know it, so they weren't virgins. Pregnancy you know. comes after marriage. Oh my you know. God. Oh, ideally, but it yeah. really doesn't. Most marriages, usually, yeah. it's after a pregnancy. Um, okay, so anyway, I'm sorry I'm getting off topic. Um, uh, no, but this is good because... Um, you were forced into marriage. Yes, I was as a teen at 19. My father forced yeah. me to marry, yes. Because of the, you know, the I Catholic mentality. Son, and he did not want me to be a part of his social life. And he was a socialite in Los Angeles. Uh, one of his best friends. He wouldn't was accept you Tom as a Bradley, single mother. Right. And um, Tom was a good friend of mine as well. He. He was a friend to me, you know. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time alone or anything like that, but I would go to um, the mayor's office with my dad, and they would have really deep intellectual talks that lasted an hour, an hour and a half. They were wonderful, really brilliant, and they were about Mexican-American politics and what La Raza the voices of La Raza were thinking and talking about in terms of rioting in Los Angeles and what are we as a Hispanic community going to do about the injustices that are being perpetrated in our communities. Mm. So um, the conversations were really thrilling to me personally. And um, so Tom Bradley was one of my dad's um, best friends and um, he had many others, uh, Jerry Brown, and Jerry's father, uh, his father, they'd been best friends for 
like two family generations, the father and then Jerry, the son. Um, anyway, uh, so yes, that's why I was forced to marry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because I wound up getting pregnant without being married and it was I won't even go into that at yeah. this point. Yeah. Okay. Um, not until marriage was um, I supposed to consent to intercourse, and I had every intention of living up to such an expectation. I have no doubt my life's course would have been much different had I had the chance and not been raped. Had I the choice. Sometimes I wonder if I will ever be able to grow completely free of the shadow of its marked on my ability to relate to a man as a woman normally does. My sexual experiences with men before my arrest left me feelings of being a whore, not a prostitute, but a whore, a slut. And subsequently, against my heart's contention, I behaved for a good part of my adult life in reaction to those feelings. Even the eight years of chastity from a man's touch has not erased a lingering sense of inner impurity, though it has provided me with times of peace, the knowledge that I have been unspoiled, so to speak. Lesbianism granted me affection and gratification without the sense of filth sex generally left me with. Now I seek to stop the past with its mechanisms of avoidance. I yearn toward complete healing. I have yearnings, I can't deny, but they must be on my terms. I will overcome my past by braving ahead today. Perhaps I will marry someone I trust. Trust is the most important element I have never quite trusted a man before while loving him and respecting him simultaneous to his trusting, loving, and respecting me. Safely, stably, and slowly, time, birth, natural confidence, and faith, based not on needs, since needs can be manipulated to distort reality into whatever it is so desperately desiring. Rather, letting time grow what is like a seed maturing with the seasons of nature's grace. So it is with my relationship with someone I call my friend. The next step is to allow myself to partake of what we have grown. A next step is to allow myself, excuse me, next step toward living more fully, not too unlike joining the same world not too unlike entering myself without the buffer of drugs. This is the time of growth. But then isn't all time and all life either the act of growing or the expression of it? November 20th, 1988, 7 o'clock a.m. Back on the isolation block at prison, I try to blot out the verbal tirades of my insane neighbor, with calming thoughts of children playing, laughing, singing in a wonderful play yard. Sometimes the mind had better warm the heart a little, give the spirit a rest while the eyes let tears of sadness go. It's good to be courageous, but I'm certain that courage is more than the willingness to defend one's belief at the price of sacrifice. To let oneself have emotions like sorrow and even regret. Then later pull oneself together to find purpose and inspiration in spite of tragedy is an individual responsibility we all share. Concealing pain, trying not to feel it, isn't brave. It's often cowardice. The adult accepts anguish as a part of life and takes hold of common goods and causes using the anchor they provide to do what she can set the world right by, not just for herself, but for others. Perhaps maturity is the best when one can completely let go of oneself and its interests and accept a world larger than oneself. That sets one free to enjoy the happiness of others. Mm -hmm. 
even if her own life lacks what she enjoys and appreciates in other lives. A sharing of that kind can help one cast off personal dilemmas so that one's personal fate is seen not as the central thing in life, but as just one of a multitude of fates, a great given. November 24th, 1988, I'm beginning to lose track of the days again. Yesterday or the day before, I struggled for a minute to recall what year it was. I realize it's one of the memories I lose pulling so much time. Year after year, 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 and on and on. Trivial things like the zip code here, visiting days, and my release date, huh, all dissolve without any recognition of great loss. I do know my date to be considered for parole is about 10 more years. Wow. Providing I managed to earn all good time and earned time possible. I've learned to hold liberation, liberation. One holds the anticipation of a sequel to a novel. One is enjoyed. You are eager to read it and see it in print, but it's hardly the point around which all your life revolves. We must get on with the days at hand, whether we're in prison or free, and concentrate on the struggles in reality that this given life presents to us, where we are this moment now, today. Perhaps it's this attitude which explains how I am able to remain active and involved in the lives of other prisoners around me. Acceptance that this is my life. These are the people I live with, a part of my community. I am able to involve my emotional self and as a result, my inner needs are better met. Hi, hi everyone, we had a little break. Uh, Cigarette smokers, yeah. That's us. Yeah. Oh, but check out, this is um, from our trip. It's Mexican Opal. We picked it up for uh, for jewelry. Her bracelet. Look at this beautiful bracelet. This would be worth so much more here in the States, but we got a good deal. And then, see, I have this... Also, like this pendant, earrings. yeah, this pendant right here, it matches my earrings. Mm -hmm. Same kind of opal, and she'll and have a opal bracelet right here. And Juliet got some beautiful opal jewelry, which um, we'll have her show you at some point. I hope. Yeah, we ended up going into this uh, opal shop, and uh, it wasn't Cabo San Lucas. It wasn't Mazatlan. It was Puerto Vallarta. Puerto Vallarta, we went into an opal shop and beautiful. The, the guy had really? such amazing pieces there. Well, you know, if you're going to buy opal, that's, I mean, if you're not going to buy Australian opal, then buy um, Mexican opal. Yeah. Because it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Yeah. And the price is really good. Um, it's twice as expensive in the States. So, a thousand dollar piece, um, what I pay, uh, let's say, this bracelet, which cost me around 500 um, if I were to buy it in the United States, it would be a thousand. Just in weight in silver and then in all the quality of the jade, or I mean of the opal. These earrings, I can't remember the prices on those. This I don't remember the price of, or her earrings or bracelet. I just know it was pretty pricey. Yeah. It was pretty pricey. You know, we spent a, a couple of thousand plus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. um, getting back on um, board, so where are we now? Did you want me to continue? Um, I think we should probably just kind of discuss it a little bit and um, whatever I can do to close help. it out. Close it out. Uh, this this sounds to me like a compilation of writings that span over at least a twenty three year period of prison. Twenty years now. Yeah. So these is this is like a journal. It is. It is basically. Yeah, it's pretty profound. I always because you go deep within I yourself I would with your emotions. It. Yeah, I wanted to publish this, but I wanted to do it in a way that was different, that was more personal. 
So I tried to make it like journal entries. And so I write the dates, the times, um, so that I don't, you know, get lawsuits. I change the names of the yeah. offenders. Uh, I know who they are. Yeah. But if I say their name publicly and print it, that I could get a lawsuit, you know? And if they haven't already lost their careers, you know? Right. Or their pensions, you know? Or yeah. if they haven't died by heart attack, yeah. you know? Um, this would definitely do it, right? Yeah. So, at any rate. Well, I would love to see it published as a book. I think Me too. It, I, I think, think it, we should do it. I think it'd be a bestseller. Thank you. You know, considering we incarcerate a big percentage of the population. More than any other country in the civilized country in the world. Yeah, I think, um, the I amount, think, I think we have got millions. something here. And you really thank need you. to share this with the world. Well, thank you. I appreciate because that. Because there's people that are going to be able to relate to your story. <laughs> Too many, I And stories. Yeah too many but it'll Sorry. also give people an understanding of which we don't have because we haven't there's us that haven't been through the prison pipeline we don't know the experience like you tell it and may I close this with um, some more of my script of course I've started this is page 400 sister me I've started chewing using chewing tobacco to stave off my nicotine attacks. I live in isolation, in the hole. Smoking only an hour a day, because they give you one day, or one hour per day, where you can smoke outside. I find it, I chain smoke the entire time. On top rolled, hand rolled top cigarettes. I've been grieving various issues here. Legal complaint after legal complaint. Documenting, documenting. Art supply limitations, light curfews, no mirrors, um, the housing of the mental ward patients and ad say, property restrictions, and other assorted matters that pop up. I keep fighting them. December 4th, 1988, the matter was posed, quote, the issue in life is not what do I expect from life, but what does life expect from me? Life has no set design or any will that can organize events. Only the individual is subjective. We individuals personalize our own existence. Life, though, does make demands on its captives. Its necessity courses through our very bodies down to the level of every soul, or every cell. Life is the force that knows nothing of defeat. It drives us on until we are defeated. Finally, by the great conqueror of all, death. Hmm. Life and death are always involved in an exchange where life embraces, death removes and consumes. All who are the stuff of life must spend our limited days joined in its battle until our time runs out bankrupt and death comes to collect out the little security that we have in time. Perhaps it's not really a battle at all, but a given and a take exchange type of thing. Give you some life, I take you to death. Then what does it mean to ask, what does life expect from me? To live, yes, I am a part of this organized action, but isn't there more? Am I then to give my most just to the endeavor of living and exhaust each spark of life until, like a candle, it runs out of fuel and blinks out? What about the physically alive vessel of life with plenty of wax and wick left who loses the will to live when life has such a clear command, go on living? How can an individual defy the greatest of natural forces and pursue death? How is it that humans can desert the force of life? Misery disillusionment, pain. How can you, how can grief usurp the urge to live, to life? A tree will go on living, even if it can, without even possessing a will, it will continue to grow. 
but a child or an adult can fall into such despair as to self-destruct. Infants and even children in orphanages have been known to retard and become apathetic. Aging adults are known to die from no more than lacking a basic will to live. Young, healthy teenagers have put guns to their heads, overdosed, cut their throats, given up their days. Something inside all these people was missing. Something a tree didn't have or need. What? What? Human touch. Human affection. Human communication. The sense of being needed, being loved, being able to express love. This is what trees don't have, don't need. These are what make us so much more than trees, but to lack human needs or be unable to satisfy them makes us so much less. Lacking them, we ally ourselves with death against our rightful ally with life. Yet we as a people have allowed our government not to see this part of our natural need. The programs and the system of our government neglect this more than they serve it. We are quick to endorse endeavors that involve defense spending building. Yet we have overlooked the enemy closer to us, ourselves. <laughs> ourselves. The enemy that strikes our homes and victimizes our children, parents, and even ourselves. The enemy of life. Passive apathy. We blame drugs, society, everything that we hold no control over. Yet we're fools because we have the power in the palm of our hands. We individually can each and every one of us find the culprit in ourselves, we allow what happens to happen. It takes one million individual people to become one million strong. One added to one is two. Added to one more is three. And so it is with power when we organize a party for ten friends and they come. That is power. We think power always lies in others, but they only have what we let them have, what we give them by our passivity. Mm -hmm. What we miss is recognizing the simple ability to work together sympathetically as a power. We say we have no individual ability to create change. We're only welfare mothers or waitresses or electricians. How do we make a difference? We unite. We unite. Sympathetically. It's a symphony. It's a sympathy as well. A basic kind of love. It makes the difference between the dead and deadly structures of power. And the real thing. Divide. And we are able to unite. We talk, we write letters, make phone calls, and talk some more. Many say there is really nothing we can do about what we know is wrong. I call bullshit. Everyone wants to complain, moan, groan, bitch, and dog, this or that, yet nothing gets done, nothing gets resolved. It's not that these bitchers are bad people. They just don't know. They can make a difference. Put the bitch on paper. Get others to sign it and mail it out. If you want changes, then do something. Open your mouth. Too often I hear others disparage the power of the individual. It's a fallacy. We are as powerful as we are willing to risk ourselves in being powerful. December 6, 1988, barely morning. My blood is bursting in my veins burning as though flecks of jalapeno chili bits were pumped in them. Hmm. An actual burning like fire ice. 
I get frenzied like this when I think of paints and a board to paint on and the basement is my eight by 10 foot stretch canvas. I've written and written administration to allow me to paint it. Paul and Rich Beyer bought it for me and Paul is a political activist and patron as is Rich. The Rich is an artist himself and my mentor, Rich Bayer. His sculptures are very popular throughout our country and the world. He speaks in a mystic voice when he explains art to me. He has a language unlike anyone else I know, abstract. I call him my art mentor because I don't understand what he says immediately. And that provokes me. It incites me to reach extra hard to grasp his meanings. He inspires me to go into that creative self where one didn't even recognize the creativity to be. Like a cherry cordial with the eater not aware of the cherry beneath the chocolate. Wow. Very good. Thank you for sharing. All right. I will stop there and um, we'll continue that later. I hope you guys enjoyed this segment with Veronica the Duchess sharing her most steepest stories. Yes, thank her you time, for having me. Her time, uh, you know, being gone, being in the prison mm -hmm. system. So uh, we shall continue with more in the future. Please remember to subscribe if you haven't already subscribed to our channel and hit the bell for notifications of when we release another video. All right, everybody. Thank you. Peace out. Bye for now. I love you.